בראשית ברא אלוהים את השמיים, את השמיים ואת הארץ. בראשית ברא אלוהים את השמיים, את השמיים ואת הארץ. Israeli author, who the floor is yours, Mr. Shalev. Great pleasure. Thank you and good day and thank you for inviting me here and coming to, to listen to this short lecture about uh, my new book, In the Beginning, Reshit in, in Hebrew. And then I started to look for other first things in the Bible. And since the Bible itself starts with the word Bereshit, in the beginning, it means that it has an interest in being first, because this is the meaning of the word Bereshit. And I found some surprises. For example, the first kiss of the Bible is not at all a kiss of love. It is a kiss of suspicion and checking. This is the kiss that uh, Isaac and Jacob kissed when Jacob impersonated as Esau and cheated his father and came to take the blessing of Esau, the older brother. And the first love in the Bible is again not the love of a couple, uh, of, uh, 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 of what we would have expected it to be, but this is the first time the word love appears in the Bible it is in this uh, well-known command of God to Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Yitzchak, and sacrifice him uh, to me on, in the place I will show you. So it is not a romantic kiss, a, a romantic love. It is a love of a father to, to a son. I think it, go, it has a meaning behind it because in the Bible, the love of a couple is not important at all in the family, the family life. The role of a couple in the Bible is to produce more and more children. This is what family and a couple is all about in the Bible. And indeed, the first command God gave to the human race, not only to, to his people, but to the human race in general, is be fruitful and multiply. Make children. Not uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, and not uh, worship me and no other gods, and not uh, thou shall not uh, kill, thou shall not steal, and so on and so forth, but be fruitful and multiply. And then I started to look for more and more first things, and eventually I decided to write this book. I want to give some specific uh, examples to that because while writing the book, of course, I, I wrote not only about being first, but also about the surrounding and the rest of the story around the, the first thing. The one thing I made myself as a rule was that if I'm looking for the first love or the first dream, uh, I have to look for the word itself. The word love or the verb to love must appear in the text. I will not do it by interpretation, because, for example, if you look for love in the relationships of Adam and Eve, you may gather there must be some kind of love there because they were in this situation that every loving couple is dreaming about to feel as if they are the one couple in the world. <laughs> Usually, when there is a true love, this is how we feel. There, is, there are no other men and women in the world but us. But Adam and Eve didn't ever have to, to dream about it. This is how they were. They were only one man and one woman in the world. So maybe love was just natural for them. But the word love do not appear in their relationships. The word passion or desire, tshuka, does appear in the text about them. If we think about Noah and his wife, whose name we don't even know, I'm sure there must be some love on her behalf, you know, being so patient with his, this craziness of building the ark for a full year and then take this travel with all the animals in it. She must be a loving woman. But, but the word love do not appear 
in the text. Then it appears when I, Abraham loves uh, Yitzhak, and the first time it appears in, in the relationships of a man and a woman, it is the son of Yitzhak, uh, 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 the son of Abraham, Yitzhak, uh, when Rivka, Rebecca, was brought from, for him from Haran, and then the Bible says that he took her to the tent of his mother, Sarah, who was dead already, but he kept her tent. And he married her, and he loved her, and he loved her. And then uh, the Bible says, then he felt some comfort after the death of, uh, of his mother, which in a way is a very interesting Freudian presentation of the relationships of Yitzchak and his mother. And Rashi, our great interpreter, indeed said that it was only after his mother died that Yitzchak was able to marry a woman. And, and this is not written in the Bible, but this is the greatness of the Bible that it makes us think more and more because the Bible is very stingy. The Bible that do not give you all this psychology that, that, that modern novelists will give you sometimes in exaggerated uh, 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 quantities. You have to make up your mind, you have to decide, you have to look for the little details about these people because the Bible will not give you everything. So the order of the things was first he brought her to his mother's tent. This is a symbolic confirmation of the parents to the future married. Then you get married. Only then love comes, if at all. Because, again, I tell you that the Bible does not put this much of an emphasis on the love, but on the family uh, 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 as, as, as a body, as a productive, reproductive body to be more accurate. And this is how they look at it. When we come to the story of Jacob and Rachel, we come to something completely different. Here, this is a love, again, the word love appears, but here, uh, it, the, the, the love of Jacob to Rachel starts before they get married. And this is something out of order in the eyes of the uh, uh, Bible uh, uh, author, of this author of uh, this story. I want to remind you a part of this meeting because maybe in this way we can learn that it is possible to look at the biblical text from a different point of view. I'm talking now as a secular person. Uh, I'm not a, a, a religious uh, a person. Uh, I read the Bible not as a collection of rules and orders, but as my heritage, as a part, uh, maybe the most important part of, uh, of the Hebrew language as historical, as moralistic uh, uh, lesson. And when I read this, the love story of Jacob and Rachel, this is where I'm really touched, not only as a reader, but also as a writer. When Jacob saw Rachel for the first time, in antagonism to the meeting of his parents, Isaac and Rebecca, things went in a completely different order. He saw her and the Bible says, then such and such happened. It means Jacob was impressed by two things, the beauty of Rachel and the wealth of her father. To show you that he was a very practical person. <laughs> And this is an element that goes on in his life from the beginning. From the little uh, bet he had with Esau about the lentil uh, uh, stew, uh, to his last words to his children. He was always a, a very romantic pe person, but also a very practical lawyer. Now when he saw Rachel and her sheep, it is, said, it is said that the first thing he did was to push aside the huge rock that covered the mouth of the well 
single-handedly. Usually this rock was put there so that one person will not be able to draw water. Only a few shepherds together can do it and then they can check the quantities of the water. So this is the first thing he did. Then he gave water to the ship of Rachel. Then he kissed her. Then he cried. And then he introduced himself. <laughs> now, is this the right order? I mean, is it really the way to behave when you meet the woman you're, you fell in love with and you're going to marry and live with for the rest of your life? You know, when you read the same, the same description in the book of Thomas Mann, uh, Joseph and his brothers, a huge, beautiful uh, uh, novel, uh, somehow uh, Thomas Mann, with his middle-class German upbringing, changed this order of things, maybe without noticing what he's doing. In his book, Jacob introduces himself. <laughs> then he helps her with the sheep, and then he says, may I kiss you? <laughs> maybe even in the third person. And he kisses her on both cheeks, like cousins do. And, and that's it. But the Bible is far more daring than Thomas Mann and far more daring than the Jewish interpreters along the generations who were also bothered by this kiss. <laughs> because Jacob is our father. He is one of the three patriarchs. We are named after him. We are the children of Israel. His other name. How come he behaves like this? So some say that he kissed her the way you kiss a little girl who is your relative on, on your cheek on, or your forehead, not a kiss of love. In the beautiful drawing of Abel Pan, of this meeting, Abel Pan was an Israeli uh, uh, artist who, who painted many biblical scenes. You can see that Jacob is leaning passionately towards Rachel while she makes put her face closer, but she puts an elbow between them as if to prevent his closeness because it is too daring. Remember, we are talking about Iraq uh, 3,500 years ago. You don't, you don't just kiss girls you don't know <laughs> near the well. So why did Jacob behave like this? I think that he wanted to impress Rachel as much as he could. So he showed her his physical strength by pushing the stone as a stranger. And he showed her his chivalry and generosity of giving water to the sheep as a stranger, a strange man. And he showed her his passion and daring by kissing her as a stranger. And he showed her his sensitivity by crying as a stranger. And only then, after she was impressed by these three, four things he did, only then he said, by the way, I'm your cousin <laughs> from the land of Knan. I'm the son of Rivka. You know Rivka, the sister of your father? Now she understands everything. This is natural, unimpressive behavior of a cousin. But the first impression was already burned in her memory. And this is what sustained their love for uh, uh, in the future. Now, this, of course, is an interpretation that the Bible do not write specifically. This is my opinion. It can be accepted by other people. It can be rejected uh, uh, by other people. I think by learning Jacob in other occasions of his life that this is a, a, a kind of behavior I am not surprised uh, to meet uh, here as well. If, if, if I may remind you, the, the dream he had, the second dream of the Bible, uh, uh, with the angels where uh, God promised him in this dream that he will uh, make him a big nation. And then he knew that Jacob is worried because he was uh, going to cross the desert all the way to Haran. And he was a young boy, unaccustomed to the field. He was living in the tent of his mother all his life. And God said, I will be with you and I will guard you. 
והשיבותיך אל הארץ הזאת, והושמרתיך בכל אשר תלך, והשיבותיך אל הארץ הזאת, I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. And then Jacob woke up in the morning, and he remembered the dream, and he vowed, and he said, If God will be with me, this is the first time God ever heard the word if, you know, as if somebody doubts his promise. If God will be with me and will guard me in this way I am going now, not when, wherever I go, in this way I am going now, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, which God did not mention in his promise, and will bring me back to my father's house, not to this land, to my father's house, so he's like a lawyer getting a contract, taking his pen, correcting the little details, giving it back. If all this will happen, he will be my Lord and I will be his people. Which means, if not, what if not? Then God will not be my God and I will not be his people. I think, in a way, God really liked this kind of reaction especially after the complete silent obedience of Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, suddenly he finds a believer from a different, a different kind of thinking. All this, again, is not something that the Bible says. The Bible only gives you descriptions of the behavior, of the words, of the acts of the heroes. It does not, the writer do not, does not explain why would not give a lot of psychology, but if we think about the little details, we can find this kind of possible, uh, 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 possible interpretations. Being, a, 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 I'm, I'm again talking more and more about, about Jacob because he is my favorite character in, in the Bible, and among the lines, between the lines that describe him, we can find many more interesting uh, uh, things concerning us today. When Jacob had this dream, God told him in this dream, the land you are lying on, because he was sleeping on, on the ground, the land you are lying on will be yours. In another place in the Bible, God said to Joshua, the, the, the general, the conqueror of, of the promised land, the place you're, you will step on will be yours. And to Abraham, God said from the top of the mountain, the land you see, look around, the land you see will be yours. So there are three different promises of the land by God to his people. One is the land you see, one is the land you lie on, one is the land you step on. The land you step on is the land you purchase, you get, by military occupation. You step with your boots and this is yours. The land you see is some kind of a remote, even cold kind of connection to the land. The eye can feel further away than any other sense, much more than the touch and the smell and, and, and the hearing. But still there is something cold, not something intimate. The land you are lying on is almost erotica. This is the real connection of a man to his land. It's the full touch. And our sages, who cleverly were worried about the size of the land you are lying on, <laughs> it's like two meters or one meter, <laughs> not enough, you know, said that at that very night, God folded all the promised land under the body of Jacob, and in the morning later, he opened it again. So if, if you were worried about this, there, there is no reason to be worried. But when we talk about the character of Jacob, we understand more and more why we are the children of Israel and not the children of Isaac and not the children of, of uh, Abraham. Because there are three, the three fathers of Israel are these grandfather uh, Abraham and his son Isaac and the grandson Jacob. 
Of course, technically, you may say that we are the children of Israel because Abraham had other children and, and, and Isaac had other children. Esau is also the children of Isaac and Ishmael is also the children of, of, of uh, Abraham. As for Jacob, it is only us. But I think that being named after him and the land being named after him, the land of Israel, not the land of, ja not the land of Isaac and not the land of Abraham, is because Jacob in his behavior, in his personality, in his psychology, in his being both romantic and visionary and both practical and legalistic, in a way is the true father of the people of Israel uh, till today and he deserves this. The, 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 the land and the people uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be called after him. I finished this uh, uh, description in, in the book of, of, of uh, the personality of, of, of Jacob with him ordering his children uh, to bury him in the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron together with uh, his uh, grandfather and grandmother and his parents and with Leah, one of his two wives, uh, the two sisters. And he says that he wants to be buried there next to Leah. And we wonder because in, in the book of, uh, uh, in, in the early story in the book of Genesis, we know that in the beginning of the relationships, Leah was the hated woman. The Bible said, Aisha has snu'ah, he uses this horrible word, the hated woman. And, and, and this is how she refers to herself. She, she said, she, when she gives the name to her first son, God saw that I'm hated, so he gave me this son. And when you think about this combination of the two women, Rachel and, and Leah, because Jacob fell in love with Rachel, uh, and Lavan, their father, cheated him and gave him Leah uh, uh, in, the sh in the darkness of, of the night, doing exactly what Jacob did to his father, using his blindness and impersonating as his brother. The, the two sins are equal. Here one sister pretends to be another sister in the darkness of the night, and here a brother pretends to be the other brother in the darkness of the blindness of his father. Uh, and in the morning it is says, in the morning it was Leah. We are all sorry for Jacob. But God is not sorry for Jacob. God gave him a lesson. First, it was a punishment for what he did to his father. And the second is the punishment for his daring and his behavior when he met Rachel for the, for the first time, when he put love and passion before marriage. And when in the morning he saw it was Leah, this kind of transformation, it's as if God tells the reader, we may read it like that as well. I'm helped here by, by our poet Yehuda Michai who said, in every loving woman there is a Rachel and a Leah together in every single woman, loving woman. There is a Rachel and a Leah who exchange between themselves the tastes of the day with the spices of the night and the dresses and the, and, and the perfumes. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. And he says, in every woman there is Rachel, the burning woman, Rachel, who knows about her death in, chi her death in childbirth. And the other one, the softer, the heavier, Leah, to, in all the generations, till me. Because she is the, the, the big mother and, and, and not Rachel. So we have these two women. Rachel, the, the romantic, the passionate, the, the, the woman dreamt by her lover. And there is Leah who will make children. And we know what God likes most. God wants children. He's not interested in love. And when Jacob wakes up in the morning and he sees that it's not Rachel but Leah, he's very angry and very sad. But we know that in the eyes of God, 
you don't have to get married with two sisters. Every wedding you go to sleep with a Rachel and you wake up with a Leah. This is, what, this is what the Bible wants to say to the Jewish reader. This is my intention. This is the night of transformation. From now on, we want a mother, not a lover. And when Jacob asks his children to bury him next to Leah, there are two things here. One is to say, in my last day, I accepted this kind of, of interpreting the relationships of a man and a woman. She is my woman. She, Leah, is my woman, my wife, the one I want to be buried next to it. The other explanation, of course, is historiosophical. The author may be a descendant of Leah and not of, of uh, Rachel. I know it from my own family, but I will not get into <laughs> details. But there is another thing in this, uh, in this uh, demand of Jacob, which I think is the most meaningful. Jacob knows that his true love to Rachel were, was in the seven years in which he was working and waiting for her. Those seven years in which the Bible put maybe in the most beautiful verse of the Bible, and Jacob worked for Rachel for seven years and they seemed to him as a few days because of his love to her. These are the years of yearning, of longing, of dreaming. Later, when they got married, we saw the ups and downs in their relationships, the pain, the suffering, the love, the passion, the, 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 the quarrels. They had a horrible quarrel after the fourth son of, of Leah. When Jacob says he wants to be buried next to Leah, which means far away from Rachel, maybe he wants to eternalize this situation of longing and yearning and not the situation of possessing and materializing. And this is a lesson that goes far beyond romantic relationships between uh, a, a couple. This is a lesson for the children of Israel till today. This is the, the situation or the condition of yearning and expecting for Jerusalem, for the Messiah, for the temple, for redemption, is the natural situation of the Jewish people. So don't materially, materialize everything. Don't achieve everything. Don't possess everything. Leave something to, uh, to long for, to yearn for, and maybe this is the reason why whenever somebody is defined as a messiah, the Jewish people will reject him. Because they want to wait for the messiah. ובן החושך, ויקרא אלוהים לאור יום, ולחושך קרה לילה, והארץ הייתה תוהו ובוהו, וחושך על פני תהום, ורוח אלוהים